The contents of this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of, nor an endorsement by, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or the U.S. government. Welcome, public health professionals and others. I'm pleased to present Module 1, Foundations of Lead Exposure, Segment 4, Roles and Responsibilities for Jurisdictions and CDC. At the top right, there are pictures featuring a father with a young daughter in his lap, a picture of a mother and a child at a doctor's office, and classroom with diverse students. In the bottom right is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention logo, which also shows that CDC is a part of the Department of Health and Human Services. The purpose of this segment is to introduce the roles of state, local, territorial, and tribal public health department staff and CDC partners in supporting implementation of the childhood lead poisoning prevention programs. This segment will help trainees identify how specific public health roles relate to the lead program's four core strategies for managing a CDC cooperative agreement. The CDC Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program is authorized by the Lead Contamination Control Act of 1988. The Act allows CDC to initiate comprehensive program efforts to eliminate childhood lead poisoning in the United States. A picture showing the United States Congress logo. This Act also authorizes CDC to help state and local agencies develop comprehensive childhood lead poisoning prevention programs, also known as CLPS. The purpose of these programs is to identify and monitor children at increased risk for lead exposure through enhancing blood lead screening efforts, ensure referral for medical and environmental intervention for lead-exposed children, and provide education about childhood lead poisoning prevention. The three goals of the CDC's Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program include, number one, reducing blood lead in children at or above CDC's current reference value of 3.5 micrograms per deciliter, and reducing risks among disproportionately affected populations. Number two, Supporting the objectives of the Federal Action Plan to Reduce Childhood Lead Exposures and Associated Health Impacts. And number three, supporting the Healthy People's 2030 goal of reducing blood lead levels in children ages 1 through 5. The target population of CDC's Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Programs is children less than 6 years of age, or 72 months. There's a specific focus on the following children, less than 3 years of age, children living in homes built before 1978, those living in housing with known or suspected lead hazards, children living near hazardous waste sites or industrial emissions containing lead, children who are non-Hispanic black, children who are recent immigrants, particularly refugees, children eligible or enrolled in Medicaid, and children receiving services from WIC, which is the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children. The four program strategies for developing a lead prevention program include Strategy 1, Coordinating Screening and Testing Plans Strategy 2, Implementing Effective Blood Lead Surveillance Systems Strategy 3, Developing Policies, Partnerships, and Interventions that ensure a comprehensive system exists for the identification, referral, and follow-up of children exposed to lead And Strategy 4, Ensuring primary prevention of childhood lead poisoning through the development of targeted population-based policy interventions with a focus on community-based approaches for lead hazard elimination. Over the next few slides, I'll detail roles and activities for Strategy 1, Testing and Reporting. Recipients funded for childhood lead poisoning prevention programs are required to test children for lead and report the results to CDC. A number of steps are included in this process, First, recipients are required to develop and sustain a statewide lead advisory committee. Second, recipients should develop or update and then implement a statewide screening plan based on local data. Third, recipients should increase awareness of state blood lead testing recommendations and reporting requirements among pediatric healthcare providers and clinical laboratories. And fourth, Recipients should enhance secondary prevention of childhood lead poisoning through ensuring blood lead testing and reporting, improving linkages to recommended services, and enhancing blood lead surveillance. The establishment of an advisory committee is a critical component of an exemplary lead poisoning prevention program. This entails establishing and maintaining community partnerships, establishing and maintaining partnerships with medical providers, hosting and providing oversight for the state lead advisory committee setting a meeting schedule, 
developing a strategic plan and priorities for lead prevention in the community, and establishing roles for committee members. In the next few slides, I will detail roles and activities for Strategy 2, Enhancing Blood Lead Surveillance. Identifying and tracking children exposed to lead are critical programmatic functions. Jurisdictions must develop, support, and sustain a blood lead surveillance program. Activities for surveillance include developing and implementing plans for surveillance data collection, data quality and data dissemination with a focus on data interoperability, developing, updating, or maintaining a blood lead surveillance system that collects and tracks all blood lead test results and follow-up data on children with higher blood lead levels. In addition, conducting analysis of surveillance data to identify lead-exposed children, high-risk populations, and geographic areas. Other activities include collection, analysis, and interpretation of health-related data for the planning, implementation, and evaluation of public health practice, tracking and monitoring health trends to determine risk factors, target interventions, and guide other public health actions, managing local and state data and state surveillance systems to transmit data to federally managed surveillance systems, previously stellar, now helps, and using reported data to identify at-risk children in areas with high exposure burden. Critical jurisdictional roles for surveillance include working with epidemiologists, interpreting surveillance data, assuring data quality and staff training, sharing data reports with partners, disseminating data, reporting data to CDC, and using data to assess program performance. Surveillance systems should be evaluated regularly for quality, relevance, and future application. Strategy 3. Improving linkages of lead-exposed children to recommended services is also a vital component of a lead prevention program. Linking lead-exposed children to vital services requires using surveillance data to identify children with higher blood lead levels. It also requires follow-up, partnering with programs and organizations that provide services to mitigate the effects of higher blood lead levels, and connecting children with higher blood lead levels to medical, environmental, behavior, and social services. Closing the gap between testing and care requires comprehensive knowledge of a community, its resources, its medical, and other service infrastructures. Linking children with higher blood lead levels to services includes establishing community partnerships, sharing and matching data, establishing relationships with care providers, and collaborating with state medical boards, Medicaid-managed care, and insurance companies to assure blood lead level screening and follow-up testing are accomplished. This also entails coordinating home assessments, organizing patient care activities, tracking and reporting uptake of care, and linking affected children to educational resources to assess cognitive and learning impacts. In order to ensure the primary prevention of childhood-led poisoning, jurisdictions are funded to develop targeted population-based policy interventions with a focus on community-based approaches for lead hazard elimination. Our funded jurisdictions are charged with developing strategic partnerships and policies aimed at primary prevention of lead exposure. Conducting primary prevention of childhood lead poisoning may include using principles of cultural competency and health equity to meet the needs of populations at risk, matching interventions to appropriate subgroups of a population, becoming acquainted with communities and the populations served, using surveillance data to inform targeted program development with identification of high-risk populations, areas, and activities, and developing and implementing interventions targeted to meet specific needs of communities. Steps for developing a targeted population-based intervention include tracking, using surveillance and other data sources to target populations at risk, Pinpoint social determinants using other sources of data to characterize populations at risk such as income, education, and low-wage high-risk occupations. Identifying at-risk groups in your jurisdiction. Developing plans to provide primary prevention in populations most at risk. And establishing and maintaining a wide range of community partners. These partners can be governmental and nonprofit organizations, WIC, Medicaid, housing agencies, community organizations, or other entities. A childhood-led poisoning prevention program's expected outcomes should include improving blood lead testing and reporting rates for children less than six years of age at risk of lead exposure, 
improving the use of surveillance systems to capture missing data on children's sociodemographic information and follow-up information, improving the rates of children less than six years of age with blood lead levels greater than or equal to CDC's blood lead reference value who are linked to recommended services, and decreasing disparities in blood lead levels by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Jurisdictional management responsibilities include managing resources and budget, managing staffing, managing program logistics, managing program implementation, reporting to CDC, and conducting program evaluation. The following are reporting requirements that jurisdictional partners must adhere to in accordance with CDC cooperative agreements. Reports that must be submitted include Evaluation and Performance Measurement Plan or Concurrence with CDC's Data Management Plan, Quarterly Surveillance Data Reports, Annual Performance Report, or APR, Annual Program Success Story, Awardee-Led Profile Assessment, or ALPA, Federal Financial Reporting, or FFR, Forms, Final Performance and Financial Report, and Payment Management System, or PMS, Reporting. How will CDC support recipients, you may ask? Recipient engagement will include reporting and establishing consistent communication with your assigned project officer, which, at a minimum, will include participating in monthly calls or other calls established by program leadership. This is an opportunity to discuss questions that you may have about the cooperative agreement, your work plan, or your budget. We will also conduct quarterly calls, annual calls, and site visits, either virtual or in person. As your partner in lead poisoning prevention, CDC is responsible for tracking recipients' progress in achieving the desired outcomes, ensuring the adequacy of the recipient systems that underlie and generate data reports, creating an environment that fosters integrity in program performance and results, ensuring that work plans are feasible based on the budget and consistent with the intent of the award, ensuring that recipients are performing at a sufficient level to achieve outcomes within stated timeframes, working with recipients on adjusting the work plan based on achievements of outcomes, evaluation results, and changing budgets, and monitoring performance measures, both programmatic and financially, to assure satisfactory performance levels. Here are a few definitions and some additional information that we hope will be helpful. What is a cooperative agreement? A cooperative agreement is not the same as a grant. It's a financial assistance award that provides for substantial involvement by the awarding federal agency in carrying out the activity proposed by the non-federal entity. CDC staff are substantially involved with recipients in program activities above and beyond routine monitoring. A success should be aligned with the goals of your program. A success should be impactful and make a difference. Having higher numbers of screened children is great. But what is the overall outcome for those children who are screened? How has it changed their lives or community? Effective success stories demonstrate a tangible result of your program's goals. A proper success story shows that the project and work that you've been doing are helping facilitate change. A success story is also a promotion tool. Why not show off to other community groups or to CDC and other recipients that your program is capable of making a difference? Success stories also highlight your program's goals through demonstration and impact, rather than just listing guidelines or standard operating procedures. Success stories allow you to chronicle your efforts, showing step-by-step -step how you've reached your program goals and improved your community. It summarizes your program's efforts and is easy evidence for decision makers when curious about your local operations. Managers of existing CLIP programs have likely been asked at one time or another to respond to requests from governmental officials or other stakeholders about their program. Findings from evaluations may be helpful with such requests. There are many reasons to conduct an evaluation. Evaluations may demonstrate program value, demonstrate effectiveness and impact, improve program design and implementation, and determine if program implementation is going as planned. The bottom line is, Evaluate to assess program practice and effectiveness now and identify areas for improvement. The Lead Exposure and Prevention Advisory Committee, also known as LEPAC, is charged with providing advice or recommendations for one or more agencies of the federal government. The LEPAC shall provide advice and guidance to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, the Director of CDC, and the Administrator of ATSDR identifying at a minimum 
federal programs and services available to individuals and communities exposed to lead. Current research on lead exposure to identify additional research needs, best practices or the need for best practices regarding lead screening and prevention of lead poisoning, and effective services, including services relating to health care, education, and nutrition for individuals and communities affected by lead exposure and lead poisoning. LEPAC also undertakes any other review or activities that the Secretary deems to be appropriate. Graphic showing the Lead Exposure and Prevention Advisory Committee, LEPAC, mandates and the CDC logo in the top right. The CDC Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program is creating the Lead Exposure Risk Index, which is a tool to help recipients estimate the risk of lead exposure and prioritize high-risk areas appropriately. The LIRI, as it is also called, will be available to recipients. LIRI data can be extracted to an Excel or shareable file. This resource is currently in development. Graphic showing the 10 key factors that were used to create the Lead Exposure Risk Index, LIRI including sociodemographic, housing age, environmental, and geographic factors, and a graphic showing the 12 common sources of lead exposure, including lead from deteriorating paint, soil, take-home lead in occupations, some toys, contaminated water, and imported products. How can CDC CLIP assist you? CDC will provide guidance on implementing activities and identify major program issues, strategies, and priorities. CDC will provide support in the development, enhancement, and implementation of lead poisoning surveillance programs. CDC will aid in the evaluation of surveillance activities. CDC will provide technical assistance in assessing program effectiveness. CDC will provide healthy homes and lead poisoning surveillance systems, also called HELPS, at no cost. CDC will support system deployment and the migration of data from other systems to HELPS. CDC will also promote collaboration with other federal, state, and local partners. This presentation was developed in collaboration with the American Academy of Pediatrics and Ms. Wilma Jackson, who is a program services team lead in the Lead Poisoning Prevention and Surveillance Branch, proposed in the National Center for Environmental Health at CDC. The contents of this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of nor an endorsement by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or the U.S. government. Thank you for viewing Module 1, Segment 4. For questions or comments regarding this segment, please send an email to the following address, leadinfo at cdc.gov, and indicate Training Question Module 1, Segment 4 in the subject line.